Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest monthly webinar series of Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss designing data for business intelligence and analytics, where the star schema fits in a modern data architecture. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you'll find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of the session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get her presentation started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon, and thanks everyone for joining. Always always a pleasure to do these. Um, if this is your first time joining us, uh, this is a series. Uh, one of the great things about Dataversity is they keep all of the previous recordings, um, I think in perpetuity on their, on their website. So if any of these previous um, topics from earlier in the year are of interest to you, they're all available on Dataversity for replay. That's often one of the most common questions, will you get these slides and will there be a recording? And that's all available um, on the Data Diversity site. And we also posted a link to that on our website as well. Um, this topic, as, as, as uh, Shannon mentioned, is designing data for BI and analytics and, and where the good old fashioned star schema fits in that. Uh, next month, we'll actually be live at the DGIQ conference in Washington, DC, if anyone's gonna join us there. Um, and we'll talk into the business benefits of data modeling. We'll touch on data modeling a bit, um, in this session, which is, if you know me, is near and dear to my heart, um, but we'll do a whole session on that next month uh, as well. So um, why are we here today? Uh, unless you've been living under a rock, um, you know, you, you've heard about data and analytics and BI and AI and all of the great um, aspects of data. That's often what kind of people think of when they think of data is the reports or the dashboards. We all know that there's a lot more around data. Um, but you know what is the challenge is there's so much happening in the industry and what makes our industry super fun, <laughs> especially if you're technical and love to play with the new architectures and new tools. Um, but what is the best way to support dashboards and analytics? Um, is it still the the star schema? Are there are there other ways? Um, and how did that fit into what we call a modern data architecture? And what does that mean? So we'll we'll you know, never one answer, but we'll kind of talk through that today, and that's really the topic of our exploration today on the webinar. So a little bit data behind the data, um, data diversity and global data strategy each year put together a survey on trends in, in data management overall. So this is everything from from AI to master data to metadata to everything, um, and, and that what's nice to see is fairly consistently and it is growing the data. Um, you know, organizations see data as a strategic asset. They understand that. The, the second bullet there, typically why people see that as a, a strategic asset is, is reporting and analytics. That's kind of the face of data. That's where, you know, a lot of, again, business folks think of data as their dashboard, really. Um, and that's been consistent. Um, I guess Shannon might correct me, but I think it's been like seven or eight years we've done this survey. And I think every single year, the number one driver of data management is reporting and analytics. Like that's not going away. That's not a bad thing. There's other things as well. Uh, but I think we'll consistently see that. Uh, one, one stat I like to see is that bottom one um, that folks proactively said that they felt that there was improved collaboration through a defined data architecture. We see that all the time in our practice. I think a lot of folks' brains don't initially go there if they think of architecture as kind of a tech thing or um, but we see things like like data models or, or some of the tools we'll talk about of getting that way to kind of communicate to the business about how we do the architecture. I think a star schema is actually a great way to do that. And we can kind of talk about that. But I, I think, you know, it's a misperception that architecture is only a techie thing. It's it's both and, right? There's definitely a business aspect um, to data architecture, which is why we have a whole webinar on it next month. Um, but we'll, we will get a little bit more into both the techie um, side as, as well as a little bit of the business side as well today. Um, moving ahead. 
Again, this is just a little bit more meat behind that stat that I mentioned of when folks say, what are your business goals and drivers for data management overall? Again, this wasn't necessarily a technical question. It could have been, you know, saving costs or reducing risk or that, you know, famous digital transformation, increasing revenue. One of the, which which all has a business intelligence component, right? If I'm trying to, you know, understand uh, my, my revenue growth, I probably want a dashboard to really understand that. But the number one answer was gaining insights through reporting and analytics. And again, that has been fairly consistent across every year. So, you know, that this there is definitely a business driver for things like dashboards and, and analytics. Um, so I think we all understand what a dashboard is. This is kind of a, you know, nice generic <laughs> dashboard for Acme code that kind of sells widgets over time. And you've got your nice visualizations and, and more and more. Um, the self-service analytics is a big thing. A lot more business people can see the data. I guess my, if you've heard me present, I, I have my all, all my little rants that I, that I get upset about and you get to hear them all. One of my rants is, you know, what what about um, what about the data? You know, the data behind the dashboard. And I think more and more people are getting it. If they don't get that the data has, you know, garbage in, garbage out, they will very quickly once we start building dashboards. So we work with a lot of organizations in a lot of um, range of maturity. A lot of folks come to us as a you know consulting company as, hey, we have these dashboards and I don't trust the numbers between total revenue by year. Um, or what do we even mean by year? Is that fiscal year, calendar year? I mean, gosh, we're on a site today and that, that came up in about six of the interviews, just what is a year? <laughs> you know, what was an account? All of these, these classic things. Um, some companies don't yet see those problems because we're not even in a data-driven culture where we're using dashboards. Um, so, you know, even getting data, you know, there's always that, that balance of do we start to get the reports in front of people when we know the data quality isn't there? And there's a chicken and egg. It's a both and, right? You sometimes have to show the data in its unclean state before you even need to clean it up. Um, so really to make a dashboard sing needs a lot. Um, the first one is even having that data-driven culture. As I just talked about, do we even use dashboards in our sales meeting? Or is that classic, I don't need a dashboard. I've been doing this forever. I have a guy, I know you tell me I don't know who my customers are. You don't know where I should sell my product. And the, the, the frustrating thing is, you know, we're probably 80, 90% right. Um, but actually, a, a, I was talking just to a customer yesterday and she's like, yeah, well, we actually did the analytics and we were about 90% right with our gut feel about that 10% was pretty darn important. We were missing a huge 10% that we hadn't thought of and we needed the dashboards to look at. And I, I, I think that's actually very accurate. It often is that, you know, 10 to 20% you might be missing. Um, and in today's business environment, you know, that 10% to 1% can mean being the leader or not, right? Uh, the data governance aspect we talked about, you know, how do we define total revenue? How do we define a year? How do we find a product? How do we define a customer? All of that, right? Well, when we say South America, what countries is Matt? Is Mexico South America? Is that North America, right? So all of these different questions, uh, the data quality, is the source data accurate, right? That all could, each of these could be a webinar in and of itself. The other aspect and where we're focusing today is that data architecture piece. So say we have all of that above. We know what we want to slice and dice by. We know we have the data quality and we know what these numbers mean. How do I, as an architect on the architecture side, manage this? Is it a data lake? Is it a data warehouse? Is it a data vault? Is it Do, do, I, do I even need any of that? Because the tools are so good nowadays, I can just point it against the source systems and look at the nice pretty visualizations. You know, maybe data architecture itself is old fashioned. We just have these viz tools. I don't believe that. Um, in general, uh, there's a place for that in some cases. Uh, but what is that right answer, which is really what we'll delve into today? Um, what's frustrating and exciting, depending on your mood in the day and your workload, right, is that there are so many options out there, right? There's the, the good old fashioned data warehouse, right? Or is that is that a or is that a dinosaur now? And now everything's a data lake, or is the hype cycle for a data lake over and now there's a data lake house, or is it a data hub? And what does that mean? Or is it really an, a master data or an MDM hub? Or is it a data mesh? Or what's the difference between a data mesh and a data fabric? And what about virtualization? Is that really a fabric or a mesh? And maybe it's a catalog of data, but is it a data catalog or a metadata catalog or a data marketplace of data? Or is that the metadata marketplace that points to the data market? Why don't we just put it all in a knowledge graph? Or is that relational, non-relational star schema? Right. And I'm talking quickly on purpose because this is how your brain might feel, right? Which is probably why you are at Dataversity to try to help 
make sense of this. And we'll talk a little bit about this. So all these are different unique things. Many of them have their place. Um, many of them, in my opinion, are hype or different words for something we've been doing in the past. Um, that's kind of what we'll talk about today because it can get very confusing. Um, again, a nice data diversity survey. When we we delve into a little bit in terms of, you know, what we, we talked before about what are people's business drivers for data, and it was gaining insights. Well, there's a lot of ways you could gain insights. You could just point AI to everything, and maybe that's your insights. But we we kind of delved into this a little more. And what kind of data management aspects are you using to gain insights? And the number one is still data warehousing to support business intelligence reporting. I'm actually pleased by this graph in that data warehouse um, uh, is still the, the number one above BI because, again, the temptation with some of these self-service BI team tools, they're slick. And you can do a lot. You can do a lot off a spreadsheet. You can, you know, you can... You can do a lot, but to, to have the maturity that you really, for enterprise reporting, need some sort of warehouse or some sort of data store behind it uh, to make that sync. And, and there's a whole lot else that needs to go along with some of these aspects. Um, but that is still, the, the data warehouse still sort of leads the day in terms of what people are looking at. Um, the other question is, and, and I feel old enough now to have lived through an entire hype cycle, because I, I do remember the day and, and was skeptical at the time. And gosh darn it was proven right um so a lot of the vendors and, and i can think a lot of you probably felt this way when there was why are you why, why are you spending time with a warehouse or a data mart or a ods or anything else that's architect we have a data lake now just dump everything in the lake i mean gosh the, the lake is so powerful and and these tools are so powerful you can just put stuff in there well i, I think we all know this kind of like your file cabinet i could have a really big file cabinet and throw all my papers in there and but how do i organize those papers right and so that said, not everything lives in a data warehouse. I'm doing sensor data streaming from smart meters for a water company, right? Or I'm I'm a, a shipping company and I, I want to see the sensor data for my trucks to see or my driver's speeding, right? Some of those are great use cases for data like that you cannot and should not do in a data warehouse, right? So it's not an either or, it's a both and. Which I, my One of my other rants and frustrations in life is that's hard for the human brain to comprehend the both and. Um, but when we asked the survey, I, I thought this felt pretty accurate in terms of what I'm I'm seeing, uh, that people are using data lakes, but generally in conjunction with a data warehouse. Um, some people aren't using lakes at all. Not everybody has a use case for a lake. I mean, in some ways, you know, a lake might be your kind of raw landing area for your structured data before you transform it into a, a warehouse or something else, right? So um, it isn't for everybody. It is a thing. Um, I, I like to think, and we'll talk more about this in terms of zones for your data, right? There's many storage patterns for data, one of which is a warehouse, one of which is a lake, one of this might be an operational data store or et cetera, et cetera. And to think of it that way sort of avoids that, you know, either or, because I think almost every organization of every size has the both and or many, many ands. Um, and, and thinking of it that way really kind of helps go through, well, what are, what are my use cases for a lake? What are my use cases for a warehouse? What are my use cases for real-time streaming, et cetera, et cetera? Kind of helps, at least in my brain, um, kind of put these different solutions together. And we'll talk more about that. Um, so because the data lake does have a different architecture of purpose, and there may be different use cases and audiences. So uh, this is one very super high-level pattern. But you know, think of a, a data lake. It could be real-time streaming. It could be exploratory data from social media analytics. It could be sandbox data where we're just, we're doing some data science. Um, it could be your actual, um, you know, real uh, operational enterprise data that you are doing data analytics and discovery on, right? So there's a lot of different options, and, but the storage pattern is, is different. And you can have, you can have video, you can have, um, you, you can, you can have structured data, but there's also a, just a, a wider range of the type of data, the vol, you know, the, the classic, you know, Vs, right? The vol, <laughs> I'm going to trip over them, right? The volume, velocity, um, all of, you know, variability, all, everyone has their different Vs, uh, but that's really your data lake, which is a different thing than, and here's just some options, there are more, your enterprise systems of record, which could be your master data. Do I have a single view of my customer product account, patient, client? student, you know, whatever those are, my reference data, my locations, my account codes, my charts of account, all, all of those types of things. They don't, it's not an either or, right? A lot of, some of your, your, your biggest advocates for this system of record are 
your data scientist in the data lake. If I'm trying to do, I know, social media pattern analysis for my customers, and I don't have a single view of customer, it's going to hurt my analytics. So, so those and those lines go both ways, right? Some of the stuff you might explore in a data lake can maybe be something we want to start storing in a system of record or a warehouse, right? Your warehouse, maybe you're, you're trending over time. Your march might be that for, for different individual business units or subject areas. Your operational data might be more of a relational data sort of to, to see more real-time operational, right? So they are different things. They should be stored in different ways. They have different, uh, one of the questions early, I think before the webinar even started, what do you mean by designing data? Um, Good question. So some of it is designing the architecture pattern, this more of a system architecture diagram. Where do I store it? And then how do I store it within each of these boxes? So your warehouse may be a star schema. It may be relational. It may be vault pattern. Your operational data may be relational. It may be key value pair, right? Depending. So that's the other way of how you model or design the data. I, I'm i I'm one of my other Donna rants. Is, is I, I'm feeling that that's a bit of a a rare art, I don't want to say a lost art, because a lot of the highly paid folks doing this are the architects that sort of understand that nuance. It's not about the platform. I guess some of my frustration with you know folks of a lower level maturity is, well, it, it didn't work on Snowflake, and I'm not any vendor is better or worse here. I'm just using an example. It didn't work on Snowflake, so we sent it to Azure, and then that didn't work, so we put it in Databricks. It's like, so the platforms have their pros and cons. But it's how you architect and model the data behind it um, is a big part of this decision, which is why we kind of have some of these different boxes. I would say there's certain things that go across all of that, your data governance. And I like to say governance and collaboration, because I think when adults work together, it, it, it really has a better result for governance. Um, because people understand the why behind things. That should go across all of these platforms. I My favorite real world story, and I've, I've protected the names for the innocent, uh, but we were doing uh, an architecture very much like this, and it was a, a customer with PCI and PII. Um, kind of, it was an insurance company, and, and we went through this, and, we, and it was back to that the governance line, which is the, the purpley one, and that security and privacy, which is kind of the cousin of data you know, governance. And it was one of the new interns or new new um, employees, and they raised their hands like, "So, so I, I shouldn't be putting the real credit card PCI data onto the sandbox?" <laughs> I think the boss, you know, went white and said, "Pretty, we're, we're talking after work. We need to talk through." Because just because it's a sandbox and you can play around with things, even more so, you should be looking at what can be privacy and security, or or maybe your like is your true operational data. And absolutely, governance should go across all of this, right? Um, I would even include document management, which is not the topic of this webinar, but you know. You could say that that isn't in scope, but if someone stole my credit card information and, and when I complained to the company, they say, oh, well, that was in PDF. <laughs> I don't care how it was stored. It's still my credit card information, right? So I think you need to look across all of this. Um, and then the reporting and analytics can look across all of this, right? I can do analytics off my systems of record. I could also do it across the, the um, data lake. You know, some of these self-service BI, near standard BI reports can kind of also kind of coexist across these. So that's kind of at a super high level in terms of the six system architecture sort of level. Um, and they, they are different things. They are, they do have a different level of governance, however, in the sense of, I would stress that if I am talking about master data or my enterprise data warehouse that I'm reporting our revenue figures to the street or something like that, there would be a high level of governance. Yes, we have to decide as a, as a committee or a group and agree on it and vet it and it doesn't get changed willy nilly. Whereas, you don't want to have that level of governance on your on your exploratory data, your sandbox, right? You you want to have certain security things, but don't lock that down so much that people can't have ideas and explore, right? So kind of a lot of points there. So uh, if you've done my webinars, you've probably seen these before. We'll, we'll talk a lot about the architecture and modeling aspects of um, kind of data warehousing reporting, but none of this lives in a vacuum, right? So how do we store this? Is it a database? Is it big data lake? How do we integrate? What's the metadata? Is it for BI or analytics or warehousing? Um, do we have the right governance? And, and then the why, why are we doing this to begin with? So I, I won't go in depth in all of these. I sort of cover this a lot, but I, I think when you look at analytics reporting, you do have to look at all of these pieces and how they fit together in different aspects. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that design aspect of data architecture for, for BI um, and, and analytics there. 
I will start, even though we have a whole webinar on it next month, um, on that business aspect. And, and and I know this can seem, especially if you're one of the more technical folks on the call, it can, or you're new to data management. This can. I remember when I was new, one of my earlier data diversity conferences way back in the day. You know, someone had this type of joke of, yeah, we're building the application and we're all through testing or we're about to roll out. Just one thing. What's a customer? And everyone laughed. And I didn't get the joke. I'm like, oh, how do you not know what a customer is, right? Oh, how naive I was, right? Is it a paying customer? Is it a lapsed customer? Is it an internal customer? Is it, you know, think of anything that's important to the business. There's a whole lot of nuance to that. And getting those definitions right is key before you even do any of the behind analytics. What are we even reporting on? Is that classic? If you don't have time to do it right, you're going to have to do it again. So getting some of these clear um, definitions up front and 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 I'm not overstating this because, gosh, I've been doing this for almost 30 years now, and I still am on site with clients who have had either really embarrassing or in the news or <laughs> type incidents over something as simple as, what is a customer? And we, I worked for a company, and they actually sent um, renewal notices to prospects, right, of time to renew your product, because and, and these people didn't have the product because they went to a database that was called customer, but it was actually the prospecting database for sales. And yes, the word was called customer, but you know, and you're not going to stop salespeople from saying, I'm going to visit a customer. You're saying, well, no, actually they're a prospect, right? But you should know that when you're building a dashboard off it or, or making a business decision often. So do not skip um, the whole, you know, kind of business driver aspect of it. And there are different layers of data models or design right one might be even what are these even high level subject areas what do we even mean by a customer is that separate from prospects or is that separate from product etc etc even at the conceptual model what do i mean by some of these core terms um again on site today was something as simple as what do we mean by a year and i know that can sound so silly but this took you know one team's effort of a week to consolidate reports because the data came in and different aspects of what a year was fiscal year versus calendar year versus you know so i think if you're used to doing data management you're always asking the why or what do you mean by that and you don't want to catch that later when your numbers are wrong you have the wrong year fiscal year calendar year right so that's really up at that you know, high level um logical levels where you're getting more rules around that more attributes more detail and then the physical and we'll talk a little bit more about that today that's the actual, if you're using a database, those are your tables, right? How do I actually structure that? Those might be my data types and all of that. Um, and, and I've seen horrible, embarrassing things for companies at each level doing things wrong. I was at a site that was a retail company. Still don't understand this one. No, the, the DBA or the data engineer shortened the product code uh, field from 10 characters to eight or 12 to 10 or something like that brought down their whole website and they couldn't sell product for two days. Why someone would think of shorting, shortening <laughs> something that important without checking for the impact analysis. But again, all of these models are crucially important and they all kind of fit together. Um, and there's, and neither one is inherently better nor worse um, than the other. They have their different use cases, right? So I think we all, yes, I have weird data model cartoons. Um, normal form, right? I think a lot of us in the call sort of understand that idea of third normal form, fifth normal form, voice caught or whatever, right? Um, but really, why do we do that? That is really good, and it's not going to go away. It has its use case. It's not for everything, um, but for reducing redundancy, increasing data quality, ensuring consistency, kind of asset transactions across, right? So I want to know, I don't know, um, you know, my customers and my addresses, right? You don't want to store addresses in the customer table. You want to separate it out and make sure you have nice clean addresses you can link together with address types and all of that. Like that's really good for things like master data um, and, and some of your core dimensions and things like that for reporting. It doesn't go away. It's super valuable. It's core to a lot of what we do, but it is not everything. Um, so we also have the star schema. Um, which is kind of your, kind of looks like a star. We'll talk more about that. It's really good for summarizing and slicing and dicing historical um, data over time. It can be a very performant way of doing that, but that isn't everything, right? It's, it has a certain use case. Um, those are kind of some of the very common ones with enterprise reporting data that we use, um, but we also have, and I know NoSQL is very, very broad, and there's a lot of types of NoSQL, but just think of, say, key value pairs. That's really great. Think of something for a website and usage and, you know, websites hits by click or, you know, when I really am doing kind of that, you know, more operational real time or high volumes, 
easily flexible for change, probably not great for a warehouse reporting over time, doesn't mean it's a bad thing, right? So I think, again, I, I do hear a lot of folks saying, oh, no one uses that anymore, we're using something else. And I'm seeing this both ends, right? There's a lot of different use cases, right? And there's a whole lot more. I mean, they can't do all of them in this webinar. Um, XML has this place more of a hierarchical graph patterns. I'm a huge fan of what, you know, I, I want to see kind of connections between my customers. Can't do that very well until you do the relational one to really even understand what a customer is, right? Good old fashioned COBOL copy books. I think the Wall Street Journal had a thing the other day of, you know, so many companies are still running on things like COBOL. Um, I, I wouldn't say doing too much net new in that, but you can't knock it, it's still running, right? So, um, or S3 buckets, right? I'm just trying to kind of bucket data um, for storage and things like that. Data Vault has its place, right? So there's a lot of ways to store it. Here's some. Um, and I think the main message of this is that no modeling technique is inherently better nor worse than another. I think if your use case and purpose and drivers in terms of what good looks like is how you choose either of them. And I, I would say, don't rule out the quote, good old fashioned stuff because that still works. It still has its place. It's still running companies. Um, you don't switch the modeling technique because it's hard or, you know, I, I want to get a quick win. Um, but don't also get stuck in just one, right? I, I, I am actually a fan of the relational databases and I'm a fan of Starsky. If you're only doing that in your organization, I think you're also missing out on things, right? There is a case for a data link. There is a case for graph databases. And can you do some proofs of concept on, on ways we, we working with one big, um, oh, I can use my words. It's a, a telco company um, over in the UK and they have all of these problems that they do need to you know clean up their data and do reporting, but they got some really great quick wins with using a graph database on their existing systems and getting some early insights and then kind of, you know, moving in other directions as well. But Graph did offer them some really great advice for their sales team. So again, it's it's a combination. Just understand what you're using what for, right? Because you don't necessarily want to use a graph for your operational accounting system, right? That, it doesn't mean graph is bad. It's graph as it's, it's use case. Um, rant over. Um, so is the star schema dead, right? You have so many options now. I mean, some of the reason for a star schema was to help with, with large volumes of data. And you could be cynical and say, well, gosh, we have data lakes and storage is so inexpensive and platforms can really scale. And it's not like we can't get good performance on, on things. Um, so why would we even need a, a star schema? I will I will put my foot down and say, yes, I do think there is still a use case for it. And there's, there's many reasons for it. Um, and I still see the use case. So I do a lot of this. I do this for a living. Um, we work with dozens of companies each year and almost to a company, folks are still saying a very common, almost the number one um, request from your, your execs or your business people, your operational leaders is I want to see historical data trending over time to slice and dice by year, by reason, by product from a single source of trusted data from all my relevant systems, right? And then I will hear that. And whenever I'm hearing things like, oh, by year, by reason, by product, over time, my brain goes to a warehouse and that same person will say, but I don't want one of those old fashioned data warehouses. <laughs> I'm told I'm told by the vendors that those, you know, one uses those anymore. Um, so sometimes when I'm cynical, I'll say, well, we'll put a modern data warehouse out there, right? So <laughs> yes, th there is modern technology. We can go to the cloud. There are performant ways. Um, but there is still a place for that. Again, when you want to slice and dice by year, by region, by product from a single source of trusted data from all systems, that's kind of describing a data warehouse and a star schema is a very good way to, to do that. Um, so what is a star schema? Well, part of it, even, even performance aside, even if you could flatten everything out and you could still get the same performance, um, that that idea of kind of mental slicing and dicing. I mean, think of business users, what they're probably living on now if they don't have a dashboard is a pivot table in Excel. And this is kind of a pivot table on steroids where you can just get that performance and, and ease of use. Uh, but if you're if you're new to a star schema, and that's fine because that's why folks come to these webinars is to learn. Um, think of it in terms of uh, facts and dimensions. So your facts are what they say. Those are really your facts. So the things you're measuring the thing I like to think of on the things you're reporting on what are we measuring it's it's your sales transactions it's visits for patients it's things you're counting often you don't have a lot of after descriptive attributes 
it's just sort of your your numbers, you know, my my sales revenue and things like that, and then links out the dimensions. So you have there they tend to be have a lot of value, uh, you know, rows, uh, not necessarily always a lot of columns. And then your dimensions, that's where you're going to get the detail. You're going to say, I want to know revenue by customer by product. So when I, when I, again, when I hear a lot of those buys, to me, those are your dimensions, the things you want to slice and dice, report by or report on, however you use that in your English. So by date, region, quarter, month, sales rep, product, right? Those are often your master data domains, right? When we're talking about those different patterns, right? Because you, not everything lives in the star schema, right? So you may have a master data domain, which is your customer or your product, which kind of feeds the, we would say a conformed dimension, right? That I, when I have my customer dimension, it's conformed. I, I know that this is my single view of my customers, of my products that I can then slice and dice. So often it's your master data that can feed those dimensions. Um, so that would be a good use case of relational and dimensional fitting together in the same world. Um, because this would support back to our Acme Co who's selling widgets. If this isn't obvious to you and this is new, maybe this type of thing, visualization helped me when I, when I was learning it. Um, so your facts are the things you're reporting. I want to know total revenue by year. That total revenue um, are going to come from your, your, your kind of your facts and then the things you're slicing and dicing by, by year, by region, by product are your kind of points of that star that you can easily slice and dice by. It's nice because when you have some of these BI tools that are super easier to use, that becomes your cube, maybe your your semantic layer, and is a really nice way for self service, and is a really nice way for people who are used to something like a, um, a pivot table and a spreadsheet can take something like these BI tools with some sort of semantic layer where we know what the definition of customer is and product and sales rep. That's all been nice put together in your buffet, and people can slice and dice by it. So that is one of the positive use cases of a. Um, star schema and, and see a lot and they and, they, and you're going to have many stars so the nice thing is as we build these over time I've defined through MDM or reference data what my customer is or what my regions are and then you can reuse I might, might want to not only revenue by region but employees by region or customer visits by region or patients by region right so all of these things can be reused and that's why we call kind of call them conform dimensions because that's the benefit of reusing these over time one of the tools, again, kind of an oldie but goodie, we use all the time, and this is a simplistic version of it, is a, a bus matrix, um, uh, kind of based off a of kind of a bus architecture. It's not business matrix, which a lot of folks thought. I don't really care. But that's just a little nerd trivia. Um, but these would be all the things, again, that I want to report. Um, oh, I have it backwards. <laughs> report on, which would be your sales revenue and um, and then report by, which is your dimensions. And I'll fix this and send it out. Good data quality is important. Um, so I want to report on revenue or number of returned items by region, by sales, or by product, by customer. And, and when, when we build these out, we also have a definition field and a calculation field and a grain. I want to report on total sales revenue in U.S. dollars by day. Um, and this is how I calculate revenue. Which total sales revenue is only... Retail and wholesale revenue is a different calculation. And we're agreeing that all the re regions do it in a simple way. We often send these out to business users. It's a really great way to describe a star schema um, to a business people because they get spreadsheets. They understand, okay, I understand total sales revenue. I understand how I'm going to calculate it. And then for a, a data architect can easily take this and kind of make that dimensional model. Okay, I, my facts or my sales revenue, my my dimensions, your region, sales rep product, things like that. So kind of an oldie but goodie and kind of a nice way for kind of your business analyst and your data architect and your business to all collaborate. Because remember that quote earlier on the webinar, one of the best use cases of an architecture is collaboration. To me, this is how it fits together. There's the why of why we want to do this. There's the high level what and how, which is your bus matrix. And then that turns into your dimensional model, which is going to help all of those together in your glossary and your governance and all that together that are going to build something like a nice clean dashboard where when I'm reporting to the CEO on total revenue by region, we are all confident in that. And the beauty of it, at the end of the month, we just press the button or it's already there and we don't have to spend time cleaning it up or arguing it over and what do we even mean by a, a widget or a region or a revenue. Uh, can't be overstated. Once it works, you may be rolling your eyes and saying, really, we have to describe this. Um, but uh, I would say 80% of the companies 
I know I'm, I'm biased because folks are bringing us in because they have a challenge, but this isn't just a, everybody's doing this and it all works. There's a lot of work to get here. And if you're lucky enough to be one of those companies to say, gosh, folks don't have this, just feel very lucky. Thank your data architect. This would be a bumper, bumper sticker. <laughs> Thank your data architect today when you can uh, report on re revenue by region easily. Um, that's really probably your, your relational and dimensional models helping with that, with your governance. But again, um, there's uh, several design patterns, even within a data warehouse, the, the battle still rages. Uh, am, am I Inman, am I Kimball, am I relational, am I dimensional? Yes, <laughs> both. And I think we had some good use cases of, of where a relational model and where a dimensional model can fit. Um, is it a data warehouse and a data lake? Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a data warehouse or a data mart? Yes. Right, there's probably a good case for a, a mart. You know, please do the the design first, so that when we have a mart, we have a region. It's coming off the same design and a table of what we mean by region, right? Um, there's data vault, which again could be a whole webinar. Um, a lot of folks, a lot of folks in Europe, in particular, are kind of having uh, success on this. Kind of a flexible architecture of hubs, links, and satellites. Maybe I don't know all those defined business rules up front, or want to have a flexible way to design those. A uh, good way to do that. Um, Column, column, columnar <laughs> database with, again, that fl flexible retrieval pattern where you kind of flip it up uh, um, your columns and rows or, you know, flatten everything. And, and, and that's not a, a bad thing. You may want to flatten that from a relational database. I had a kind of a previous um, customer kind of write to me and say, we're having this big argument. I'm asking folks to flatten things because I need it for my uh, um, kind of SAS report from my, you know, she was a data scientist and they're telling me I, I can't, I should have it relational. And I said, it's a classic both and. Yeah, you should have your relational to, to make sure. Right. So again, it depends on the use case. I would not say flatten everything out to one big table if you're trying to slice on sales by revenue by region, right? But once you've gotten that and you may want to flatten some of those dimensions or flatten things out for your, your analysis, that's a good thing to do. It's not a bad thing to do. It just has its use case, right? Um, and, I, and I mentioned too, graph is a great way to discover and discover connections ac across these patterns and more. And you'll probably, some of the comments and I haven't looked at them yet here is that, what about, what about, yep, you're probably right. There's a whole lot more. This is just an example of ways to think about things. And again, I always think in zones or patterns that based on the use case, right? I may have my relational zone to make sure the data is clean and consistent for master reference or even some warehouse data, my slice and dice over time zone, which might be my um, dimensional model. I might have my flatten out everything zone for my data science exploration. I may have my discovery zone with graph to see the connections, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, not, or I may have my raw streaming zone from my sensor data from my machines and the like, right? So they all can fit together. Just think of what goes where. Um, and this is a horrible, messy eye chart, um, but, but probably is not too unrealistic from a, a real world. So I, I often break out the zones into these patterns as well. So you have your operational usage. I might have an operational system, my accounting system, my people stuff, my SCP, right? It's running on a relational database for its operational use case. Excellent use case for that. I would not put my operational system in a, um, a, a what, uh, I can use my words, a dimensional model that wouldn't make sense, right? That, But that is a perfect use case for that. I might have a web app that wants more of a key value pair for its session information, et cetera. So there's operational patterns. There's me, I want to kind of move from left to right from operational to reporting. So on the right, um, for consuming data for analytics, I might want that in a nice cube to slice and dice for reporting. I might want it flattened out for analytics. I might want time sequence data for you know some of that longitudinal analysis. I might want it in a graph for connections. And then how do you get it there, right? So there's there's zones across. I might want to transfer the data with JSON or XML or um, you know there's, there's, there's patterns for that. I may want to have kind of a sub zone at the bottom there to keep a certain golden set of data, which can be your master data, your hierarchies, your data, your your reference data of what's the single list of countries or what are my department hierarchies, right? That then can feed either your operational data. If I have a single view of customer, why aren't we using it in every system? 
And then also your think of your slicing and dicing your conform dimensions in, in your warehouse, right? So even your storage and analytics from reporting, which is kind of that middle zone, I may have some relational models. I can have my slicing and dicing model. I can have my data mall, um, model. I wouldn't necessarily put all of these ad hoc randomly here. I, what I didn't put here is real-time streaming data, which is another common use case that could then go to some real-time reporting. Um, you may do some reporting against those operational systems out to your reporting, right? None of these is necessarily inherently wrong. Just do it mindfully, right? There is a use case. I might want to drop a Tableau or Power BI onto my operational system for some use cases. You may want to take that out and put it into an ODS for performance. Um, but as long as you, you, there is a good use case for it and you've thought it through and you understand all the um, understanding around that is, is kind of the point there. So um, in, in, in summary, as we kind of walk through, and I, I did want to leave some time for QA because there's always a lot and I'm always running short, so I did not want to do that today. Um, analytics and reporting are key priorities. You do need a data architecture behind it. And there's a whole lot of choices out there, but in those choices, just choose wisely. Isn't that a movie quote, right? So um, the core fundamentals still apply. There's different storage patterns, there's different architectural patterns, and you really want to kind of think, and it's most likely, thinking back to this, a combination. If you're only using one, I would think, think more broadly. Um, and if you're stuck in a rut, think more broadly, but don't also just jump to the new shiny thing and, and throw away some of the fundamentals that, and I would say, uh, uh, Star Scheme is still a fundamental. Does it fit every use case? Absolutely. I would not put my necessarily, I don't know, my real-time streaming data to feed a real-time operational dashboard in the Star Schema. That wouldn't make sense to me. But if I want to report some of that over time, slicing and dicing um, and patterns, then, then I would. Um, so yeah, just choose that widely. Do a lot of research before you put that through because each one of these, as you folks know <laughs> on the call, many of you, each one of these takes a whole lot of time and effort. Please also do not just do uh, platform shopping. Um, and I think I mentioned that at the beginning of, oh, we did all this. We built the star schema in, you know, platform A. That didn't work. Let's switch to a different platform. That may well be the case. There are pros and cons. There's pricing for different platforms. I just see too much had nothing to do with the platform. It had to do with how the data was modeled on that platform. And I know often from a business perspective, business users don't necessarily get that. Why would they, I think tools like data models and, and bus matrices and glossaries and things like that can help with that, but they don't really need to know that. That's what an architects are for, uh, but you should be thinking of that or what the right pattern is um, for your, your use case. So before I open it up for questions, um, do think of, of joining us online for the next one, which will go more into data modeling, but more from that business side. If you are at DGIQ, both Shannon and I will be there. So we'd like to shake your hand and say hello. Um, and blatant plug, we do this for a living. So if you need help, think of us. My email is on the second slide and I will open it up for Shannon for a Q and A. Anna, thank you so much for another amazing presentation. Such a great topic. Uh, and if you have questions for Donna, feel free to put them in the Q&A panel. And just a reminder, I will send, and to answer the most commonly asked questions, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar to all registrants with links to the slides and the recording and anything else requested. So diving in here, Donna, um, when modeling for relational or document databases, are there any modeling choices that make the new database more friendly towards eventual residency in a data warehouse? Modeling for relational or document databases. I did not mention document databases, but those are, are really great as well. Um, actually storing some of the documents in the data store. Um, I think that's great. I do think, um, I mean, I generally think of kind of a, a, a pattern of, of raw landing raw and raw can be in, in a lot of different formats. I do tend towards a relay. I think document databases can be really great when there is kind of document uh, linking some of those document stores um, with that. But I, I do, I, I kind of lend towards um, uh, either a, a lake for some of the raw dating. There's also a, a question there about the streaming. That's a great uh, use case for a lake. Or I do think relational kind of wins out when you're trying to get that um, consistency or, or kind of that single version of the truth. Um, I have seen some, uh, and, and maybe I'm wrong here. I, I, I did see a customer do that with a, a graph, <laughs> um, which really surprised me. But even with the graph, they used that for exploration and ended up putting it in a relational at the end. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, 
Maybe I answered that. Maybe I didn't. But yeah, there you go. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> well, I'll let that <laughs> question or add any additional comments on that. Um, there's a there's a comment that came in the chat earlier. I just want to make sure and get to it. Um, you know, uh, if an organization already has data all over the place, where do you start when trying to get uh, things better uh, organized? Oh, that's probably every organization. They have it all over the place. Um, well, one is just creating an accurate, I, I, we often do a kind of that, it was an ugly picture that I showed. Um, I can go back to it if I can move my own slides. I, I would correctly document kind of the before and after. So this was, is a horrible, don't ever show me if, if you're on my team, this type of architecture diagram is terrible. It's a cartoon version, right? But what would be the actual real world architecture and make it messy, right? I have a thousand source systems and I have 40,000 spreadsheets. And then I have this six data warehouses that were built over time and whatever, we really have the, the realistic world, you know, where I, where we are now, do a, do a ideal state where we want to get to um, because you have to be realistic. And then you also do the business prioritization, which may, maybe next month's webinar will help with that a little bit more of the why, because you cannot boil the ocean um, and I think a data model is a great use case. We're actually, we're doing it on site this week of they, they actually are that environment I just described. <laughs> Maybe not thousands, but hundreds of systems. Um, and then what data across those can be, that can often help a data model. Gee, we have a thousand use cases and 800 systems, and, and but, but we're all converging around product data and product by location. So can we look at a data centric view and maybe start small and build out over time. So I use the word quick win. It's not a quick fix, but knowing where I want to head with a good data model or data architecture, and then how do we build out the components wisely um, is a good way to think. So think of, who, and then who cares about it, right? So we could, I don't know, pick, pick I don't know, ch chair storage by region and nobody cares about that. But if we're picking revenue, you know, product by region or something that's going to affect a lot of the different end users because you're also trying to get buy-in to this approach and and these things aren't cheap right so um so thinking of who why and then how and be realistic because you also don't want to over promise this isn't just a you know you can do some pilots and things um but but this isn't a commitment and make sure you have the right research all right next so many great questions coming in. Um, and you kind of touched that the streaming question. I should have brought that up the, earlier, but you just mentioned that you you not put real time streaming in Star Schema. Can you just go over that more slowly with pros and cons for better understanding? Yes, and I apologize. I'm a fast talker, and I, I will never be cured of it. I will try. Um, well, and again, back to your use case. So I have I'm trying to understand uh, my 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 trucks that are out. Um, on the field delivering my widgets, right? I want to know real time where they are, kind of build a ways, right? Or I, I want to know who's speeding. That would be a real time streaming and maybe a dashboard off that. That to me is not a star schema because you really want to see it real time. I want to know that Joe and Mary are both speeding and they're both in North, you know, North Chicago right now. And like that's where my product is, right? That would be in terms of those patterns and that I won't keep going back to the ugly architecture diagram, but that would be a real time streaming pattern. It would still go from, I always kind of think left to right from source, which is your truck to some sort of data lake to maybe a power BI dashboard or a Tableau or something or other. Um, that's because you really want that real time and a warehouse star scheme is not real time. I might want to then say, what are speeding patterns over time by driver, by truck, by city. We, we speed more in Chicago than, Boston. I, don't know, I made that up. Don't be offended if you're from Chicago or Boston, right? But then you might take some of that data and, and star it out and, and track it over time. So maybe that's a good use case. One really is real time where my truck is. And then over time, what kind of drivers over time speed more and where and when. I hope that'll help. Indeed. So for dimensional modeling, if a source system has a number of dimensional attributes that are just a code and a description with no other value data points, is your preference to put them into the fact, create a dimension for each, try to group them together in a junk dimension or something else? Oh, that's the classic question. Um, I, I, those are too many words in my brain. Yeah, I wouldn't, I think sometimes we architects can kind of overdo it. So that's why I think there's a nice, hmm, 
mix of, of master and reference data where you kind of clean up that and make sure those are consistent and then it can feed in your dimensions. So I, I would group, I would kind of lend towards grouping it together in this performance, right? So you, you kind of do flatten out a little bit more, or it might just, oh, oh, so the use case might define it. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm rambling here. I'm trying to say, I don't know. Oh, I'm back to my trucking example. They have a, a call station that they have to go back to in their region, but all call stations is always in one region. You just put it in the call state, right? Or, or there's a, you know, a manager for that call station. Yeah, maybe correctly, you would have a separate you know table for manager. But in this case, it really is just an attribute of that call station or something. That that is kind of that design decision, and there's no one answer. But you, whoever asked it is uh, thinking along the right lines, right? If I'm really do need to snowflake it out, or how many attributes are on that thing, it's almost your 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 relational model. Is it describe is is it describing the thing, or do I need another table for it? That really is sometimes based on the use case. And I think you can be a little more flexible in the dimensional. It doesn't have to be as, and that's maybe, maybe the correct is in the reference data set. But when I'm dimensioning it out for reporting, I might mush those together a little bit because that's the reporting requirement, right? And that's where it's a little bit of an art and a science. Just make sure you're not doing it to be lazy. You're doing it to really get the requirement and don't over. I tend to <laughs> overdo it sometimes. Well, technically the manager of that station is a different thing. But it might be, you know, there's always only one manager of the station, and it's really just an attribute of the station. Okay, let's not overdo it. All right, let's mush them together. Okay, sorry. Hopefully that helped. I love it. I, and uh, so I'm using an old system that is very uh, row-oriented. We need to govern columnar parquet files having multiple instances differentiated by dates and their names. Older repositories and people don't think that way. Is there a way to shoehorn Parquet files into an older metadata repository like this? Mm. In the chat. Yeah. I'm thinking about that one. You know what? I don't think I can say something intelligent quickly on that. I would say if that person wants to email me, I could maybe, I, I feel like I need, would need to think that one through a little bit. I don't have a quick answer. Sorry. That's a hard one. <laughs> That's a hard one. <laughs> you are not alone. I don't want to just make up something and ramble because I could do that. So, but yeah, I, I would. That's a good question. I'd like to think that through. So, get me offline. Sure. We can talk through. Yeah. So, um, moving on to the next question here is Donna. Is uh, data mesh is a new pattern emerging and being implemented in different systems? What are your thoughts on how that fits into this design pattern? Um, we did do a data mesh earlier in the year, uh, if you want to catch that. So I think there's mesh and there's fabric. Um, I mean, a mesh could be, if we, let's go back to my ugly diagram. Um, I would say mesh tends to be for more analytics, right? And and it, think of an owner from my quote domain, that might be your data mart or your data warehouse, right? A good use case, for example, we work with a university um, and universities tend to be siloed in, in some good ways, right? The physics department is going to have their data mart, which is totally different than the finance department, right? So, but there's a, a use case to maybe go, so they're kind of the, there may be a mart for each node of the mesh, right? And they are sort of the owners of my mart, might be one if we're kind of thinking dimensional, right? I do think um, there is a place in the mesh that is centralized and that might be your master. So think of that university. We should have a single view of our students. Jane Smith, who's a physics major, is still Jane Fix Smith, who's a physics major. When I'm in my node of the mesh, that's my mart or my whatever, you know, however they're storing that to know what are my grades over time for physics, that's kind of the domain or the ownership or the governance for physics. But have I paid my tuition and do I need to get a loan and can I be helped out by finance? That's their domain, right? So this kind of the central hub of standards which is your master? What is it? What is a student? Is she a part-time student? Is she a returning student? Is she a full? Is she a master's degree student? That's kind of your mat, your hub in the center, and then each of the nodes of that mesh, or the governance and the ownership would kind of be each. So it's almost like this. Think of that middle of that that analytics, or actually any of these could each be a node of the mesh when you think about it. So the physics department would still have their warehouse and their cubes that own it. And then maybe that master data and the, and the bottom would be the things that we have to cross functionally manage. That helps. 
Perfect. We've got about six minutes left. I'm going to try and get to as many questions as possible here. So Donna, what methodology would you recommend to design model a technology agnostic data architecture once we've identified the business use cases or what resources would you recommend? Um, what method? So I am, um, I would say starting, starting with a, a, a full on what are the different use case patterns, right? And then even something like this for you know, you, you, use case to method, right? I'm going to historical data over time. That might be my warehouse. Real-time data streaming from my sensors, from my equipment. That's going to be a real-time pattern, right? And then each one of those would go, if we think back to, um, this is almost like the the what is it? <laughs> like, what, what zone do I go into? And then back to that pyramid of, you know, logical, I can't get there quickly. Um, uh, I'm going to make everyone dizzy. This one, um, you know, what then then there's the design of that zone itself. So if I'm a warehouse, then I have to design my star schema. If I'm streaming, I need to design how that lands in the lake and how I segment the different lake patterns. Or if it's a it's a master data around that, I would need to have a relational. So there's kind of the the what and the why and what pattern that relates to, how that fits together in the system architecture. And then within each one of those zones, how do I model the data itself? Like is that a is that XML? Is it graph is it you know relational all of that there's my answer hopefully that helped <laughs> i like it so um donna can you please talk to more about normalizing data from different data sources and tools sure so that would be in one way just a, a common way to do that is with your normal form you know relational model I think going back to my ugly architecture diagram, which I should make prettier if I'm actually going to use it. Um, so you do have all of these systems, right, across this. And that's where that conceptual, we'll talk about a little bit of that next month, even a conceptual model of what is a location, right? What is a region? So a location might be, well, I have several locations. One is my store location, one is my region, and one is my GPS coordinates, right? So then once you even understand at a business level what those are, Often at this, and I didn't put this isn't a true architecture, right? You often have kind of that e either in your your what's this your master reference data. You could say this is my common set of locations or regions. Sometimes some of that's done in your landing or staging. Sorry, staging where you kind of get together even just to say all the data types are the same for location. So that is kind of e either kind of the light version of that is I stage it so at least all the data types are the same. Often especially for master and reference, it kind of lives in its own zone, which is this is my hierarchy of locations and this is my common list of codes and these are my common list of customers. I I tend to think of that's more of a relational pattern, but um, I mean, to me, it's more, are we getting the rules around it? Um, hierarchies can also kind of be done there. XML could be done there, but I tend to do relational. That's, I think that's one of some of the hardest part <laughs> of all of this. And that's where the governance and everything else. Once you get those nice building blocks, it's easier to throw those into a, a dimensional or into a graph or flatten them out. But getting those core definitions, I think that's a lot of the uh, the hard stuff because it takes people, people in discussions, right? It's not just a tech thing. Yeah, that yeah. is most most often the hardest thing <laughs> for sure so donna we've got an operational system and analytic reporting systems if we use a data lake as a staging area for accumulating data in source system form how can i get create a catalog that makes it easy to discover data in the lake say no to data swamps yeah no i think that's a valid i i kind of do I would call that maybe a landing, but whatever semantics. Um, staging, I think you've kind of manipulated a little bit, but say you want like, it's raw form. We're actually doing a project right now on that. That that can have it's just use case. I just want the people's off data in the people's off format, right? So I think what you can do is that it's almost your data dictionary. It's th this is what the data is. These are the tables that make sense. And this is the definition. This is because there are use cases that people just want to go back to source. I don't want to go to the system itself. So I think creating a catalog of, of where those are stored and what the different data types and the meaning is, I think is a great way just to make that accessible and that everyone knows what that data means and how it's been updated and things. So kind of a roadmap to it so it doesn't become a swamp. Um, if, if that's how you're using it, just be, is, is, it, is it just raw, you're dumping stuff or I actually am putting it here so that people can find it later. 
and often the data catalog can help with that. Perfect. Well, Donna, I'm afraid that is all the time that we have for this session. So many great questions. Thanks to all of our attendees who have joined us uh, throughout and for all the engagement. I always love that. Um, and just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording to everyone. Donna, thank you so much. Thank you. Always enjoy these. Talk Thanks, y'all. Yeah. Okay, bye.